I think we'll give it another minute for people to trickle in. Okay, let's get started. I'm Emily Breza. Um, I'm thrilled to be here today to talk about microfinance. Uh, I'm a professor in the Harvard Economics Department and I'm sitting in my office in Cambridge and I have a very uh, aggressive um, uh, eco light system. So my lights might shut off a few times and I'll have to wave my hands and look like a, a fool to, to get them to switch back on. Um, but that, but setting that aside, again, I'm thrilled to be here today to talk to you about microfinance, and we'll, we're going to have two lectures to cover the following topics. So I'm first going to start by just introducing what microfinance is, what is the contract structure, what do practitioners say is the case for microfinance, what is the case for microfinance um, after thinking about Professor Banerjee's lecture last month. Second, how does microfinance work? Which elements of the contract structure have permitted it to really grow and expand at scale? And then how does it actually work? So moving to the impact question, what do the impact evaluation results say? What have we learned uh, over the course of a tremendous body of, of research in the last uh, 15 to 20 years? And then probably next time, we're gonna switch gears and talk about uh, how do we take all of what we've learned so far to think about how to improve microfinance? And then finally, what are the aggregate impacts of microfinance when it's given at scale uh, to large um, fractions of, of the population? Okay, so just in terms of some, some housekeeping, I'm going to plan to pause for question breaks between the large topics, but please do um, post your questions if you have any throughout especially if there are clarifying questions, I've asked the moderator to interrupt and, and, and make sure that I stop for those questions along the way. I wanna make sure that everybody catches all of the nuance because I will cover lots of different papers over the course of today and tomorrow. Great. First, what is microfinance? So I'm gonna to talk today mostly about the standard Grameen Bank joint liability group model of microfinance. And you know, in the, in the years since the early 2000s, when that model was growing and, 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 and pretty new, there've been a lot of innovations and in different countries, microfinance has evolved in slightly different ways. But I think it's helpful to start with that basic starting point for what this product looked like uh, as applied uh, in South Asia. So microfinance is typically focusing on a specific kind of borrower, which subsequently has expanded. But in the beginning, it was a rural borrower who was unbanked or underbanked, had no formal access to credit. Typically the borrowers are women. And in addition to having no access to bank credit, they also didn't have any sort of credit history that they could bring to a formal lender and you know, use to, to meet their screening criteria. The basic features of the contract structure is that these are small loans. So you should think something uh, along the lines of a $200 loan, which is definitely not trivial. It's a large fraction or, uh, of, of assets or, or turnover for these, these firms, but it's also not the scale of buying a cow or a vehicle, something like that. They're collateral free, which is a very important ingredient in reaching unbanked households. And typically they're on a fixed repayment schedule. So you should think of a, a typical contract having a, a one-year maturity where individuals are making small equal-sized payments every week or every month throughout that year. 
Another feature that's often present in these types of loans is that there are dynamic incentives and borrowers can obtain a new larger loan upon successfully completing their previous loan cycle. And then finally, the group structure uh, is very characteristic of microfinance. The traditional model has joint liability. Well, what does this mean? This means that a group of typically women get together, they, they're often either assigned by the lender or they select each other when they're deciding who to lend with. They go to meetings together either every week or every month. They watch each other repay their loans. And then if somebody doesn't have the money to make their repayment, the other group members are called upon to pitch in and help. And typically under joint liability, um, you can only get your next larger loan if everybody else in your group has already repaid. So this is, a, this is social collateral in a sense, rather than traditional physical collateral. And this uh, group structure isn't something new. This isn't something that Muhammad Yunus and the earlier early practitioners of microfinance created from scratch. This mimics traditional savings associations that have been found in developing country contexts for hundreds of years. So for example, this looks a lot like a Rosca, where individuals come and pool their funds over the course of some period and every week or month a different person gets the kitty um, or a village savings and loan association. And the difference is that uh, unlike the Rosca or the savings association, microfinance is run by a formal financial institution. It's bringing external capital into the villages. And so instead of relying on what's already organically inside the village, it, it, you know, in theory, it's mobilizing much larger funds to bring into these rural areas without other types of formal access to credit. So what's the case for microfinance? Why should we be excited about it as economists? We can start with the practitioner's side. If you ask practitioners uh, back in 2005, for example, what their product was doing, what type of impacts they believed it was having, you'd actually see something that looks quite similar to um, some of the models that Abhijit Banerjee discussed in his lecture on credit markets and credit constraints. So they would tell you, look, these types of borrowers were excluded from the formal credit market before. What we're doing is we're bringing in these funds. This is an expansion in credit supply. They're getting to borrow where they couldn't borrow before, or we're offering a product with much lower interest rates than the money lenders that they would be able to borrow from in absence of us coming in. Um, the, the, you should think of the uh, interest rate in South Asia as being something along the lines of 20, 25%, which is by no means low, but it's lower than the informal sector. Um, and the interest rates are quite a bit higher in other regions. So in Latin America, those interest rates can actually approach 100% nominal. Um, and, and then with this expansion of credit supply and a focus on entrepreneurship, the practitioners would tell you, look, we're unlocking the potential of these low wealth households to be successful entrepreneurs. And many microfinance institutions have historically required that the loans be used for business purposes rather than consumption purposes. Now, of course, money is fungible, and we can talk about that much later when we look at the impact evaluations. But the original um, kind of you know, causal channel is that the credit supply will expand, households will invest in their businesses or they'll start a new business and that'll be an engine for livelihood generation, uh, for a, a better business profits, higher, higher incomes, et cetera. And so because the loans are also typically given to women, um, this should be especially beneficial for, for female entrepreneurs um, and, and overall household outcomes. Now, the practitioners would also highlight many potential downstream impacts on the household. By giving the money to women, allowing them to invest in their own businesses, this should have women's empowerment consequences. And a lot of the, the, the early uh, discussions or marketing materials put out by the microfinance institutions talk about how this is generating confidence and respect for women in their communities, um, allowing them to control more of the resources in the household, make investments in the education of their children. That's, that was one, that's one element that people really have focused on. Uh, and so there should be these social benefits uh, in, in terms of gender equality and intra-household resource allocation. Now, if we think about this all through the lens of Professor Banerjee's lecture, um, the entrepreneurship benefits, especially those fit with some of the models that he presented. 
So in some of the, in the stylized facts, low wealth entrepreneurs are rationed from the credit market. And in many of the theoretical models, this can be easily derived. And so what that means is that there exist firms with potentially higher returns who can't borrow just because they have low levels of wealth. And this is consistent with the potential for misallocation in the credit market where high wealth entrepreneurs who are low have low productivity might nonetheless get more credit allocated to them than high productivity, low wealth entrepreneurs. And so to the extent that microfinance is uh, really um, uh, relaxing that wealth constraint for the low wealth households, uh, if microfinance is being directed to the subset of people with high productivity, then there should be meaningful impacts on firm growth and firm entry, consistent with the story that the practitioners are telling. So uh, we'll come back to all of these, these, these possible channels when we talk about the impact evaluation results, but I did want to just put it out there. What should we think microfinance is doing? It, it, potentially in, in, in the best case. Okay, so microfinance has, uh, has had an interesting trajectory in the, in the public eye. Um, in the beginning, there was a lot of hype and support for microfinance. 2005 was the UN International Year of Microcredit. And in 2006, Mohammed Yunus and the Grameen Bank won the Nobel Peace Prize for their work developing the microfinance model and expanding it. And there were discussions that this is a silver bullet in fighting poverty that, uh, and then also because microfinance happens to be scalable and profitable as we'll discuss uh, in some detail, um, money flew into the, uh, flowed into the sector from venture capital investors. There was ample funding that did allow it to grow. So it was riding high in 2005 and 2006. Um, but then the narrative started to change around 2010. So the world seemed to start falling out of love with microfinance almost as quickly as it was very enamored with it. Um, I think the, the Wall Street Journal, uh, although it's a, it's a bit lagged, what you would read if you're reading newspapers in Bangladesh or, or India or, or Pakistan, I think it's still telling. In 2009, a global surge in tiny loans spurs credit bubble in a slump. And then in 2010, India's major crisis in microlending explosion of interest backfires. So there's a discussion in these headlines that microfinance doesn't, isn't this necessarily this rosy view of promoting entrepreneurship, but instead has some usurious uh, dimensions to it or you know, facilitates credit bubbles. And, and we can talk about that as well. And then in 2016, another Wall Street Journal headline, a new way to lend to the poor microfinance is making a, com a comeback. So luckily, since 2005, there's been a tremendous body of rigorous research on microfinance, which really does help us navigate these extremes of microfinance as a silver bullet versus microfinance as usury uh, that you've seen in the popular press in the you know, trajectory of microfinance. Okay. So as you also discussed with, uh, with Professor Banerjee, I think one of the one of the most interesting aspects, at least for me, as somebody who researches microfinance and studies it a lot, um, is that it really does seem to solve a lot of the problems of um, the the contracting problems that you'd imagine are first order when trying to lend to low wealth, low information populations. Um, and as you discussed with him, there are several types of contracting frictions that we might really worry about. So the first is moral hazard on project choice and effort. As a lender, you wanna make sure that your borrower is using the funds in an efficient way that'll, you know, that's not gonna put your money at risk and that's gonna mean that you get repaid at the end. But the lender itself has very little say on how those projects are, uh, the projects are selected and how much effort the entrepreneur actually exerts. So that's one. To me, I think even the, the most, the, the, even more important than moral hazard and project choice and effort is ex post moral hazard. And this is whether the borrower decides to pay you back, even if they have the money available. Um, and, and you talked about the, the Carlin Zinman paper with Professor Banerjee thinking about that kind of moral hazard uh, as, as one form. 
Um, and I should also mention, then this came up in, in the lecture with him, you know, even in a paradigm with collateralizable assets, it's impossible to fully enforce creditor rights and repossess those assets because creditor rights are just limited by the, the legal infrastructure. So ex post moral hazard to me is a, one of the primary concerns uh, for, for the establishment of a functional credit market of any kind. And then finally, of course, we have to worry about adverse selection. The target population is very heterogeneous, and it's extremely hard to observe type uh, in a, this context without, you know, long paper trails of audited books from your business. It's hard to do due diligence on the business. The businesses are small, so those screening costs are going to be expensive, uh, and there are no credit histories available for this population. So again, we have the adverse selection and moral hazard problems. Um, as looming large and being first order. So one thing that I think is quite important and fascinating about microfinance is that at a basic level, microfinance works. It solves these contracting problems. And we're going to spend a lot of, uh, of time today thinking about uh, how it's doing that. What in this recipe that we just discussed is giving borrowers the right incentives to repay their loans? It, what, what is making these products sustainable? So the typical borrower, as I said before, is underbanked by the formal sector, and they're extremely, extremely low default rates. So what that means is that microfinance has found a way to solve these problems. Um, it also economizes on screening costs, and it's, it gives a largely homogenous loan product, which means that it's sustainable from a cost perspective, and that it's something that can be scaled to large groups of people. And in good times, it can be very profitable. And so there have been phases of private equity investment, as I said, and some microfinance institutions have also IPO'd, uh, one in, in particular, one in India and one in Mexico. So all of this together means that microfinance is scalable and sustainable, and it's solving a financial inclusion aim. So this is a rare private sector win just on, on, on those dimensions. Now, again, we're going to talk about impact later, but just in terms of people want the product, um, banks can offer the product and people repay it and it scales. I think that that already is interesting and we should pause to try to understand why microfinance is, is successful on that margin. Okay, and I'm going to uh, pause for questions in just a second after this slide. So if you have anything uh, from this early introduction, please put it in the in the Q&A. Okay, so so where where did you know pre-COVID where was the world in terms of microfinance? So this is from the microfinance barometer of 2019. Worldwide, there were about 140 million borrowers for microfinance institutions. The overall portfolio is 124 billion. You can see that in South Asia, you have the largest number of borrowers. So about 86 million of those 140 are in South Asia, with a portfolio size of around 34 billion. Um, in Latin America, there are, are fewer beneficiaries, or fewer borrowers, so 22 million, but they have larger loan sizes uh, because many of these are middle income countries. And so the total portfolio there is 48 billion. And then the next biggest region in terms of microfinances is Southeast Asia with about 21 million borrowers. Uh, microfinance exists in other places. So there are 6.3 million borrowers in Africa and 2.5 million borrowers in, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. So this is just the you know demonstrating that scale, and a lot of and there's a mix I should say of nonprofit and for-profit microfinance institutions out there, and the for-profit ones have achieved a larger scale as you might as you might uh, imagine. Okay, so any any questions? We've got no questions at this point. So please don't be shy with your questions. If you have one, I'm sure others have the same exact one. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so now the next thing I wanna talk about is how does microfinance work? How, what elements of, of the recipe that I outlined at the top are responsible for getting it to that point of, of being able to scale? Okay, ah, how would I explain, here, so I'll, I'll just pause for a second. How would I explain that in Africa, microfinance is not gaining ground? So I think my best, um, I, I'm much more familiar in my own personal experience with the South Asia model. Uh, my best uh, guess in microfinance originally is that um, uh, population density is much lower in Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, what this model required at least at the beginning, and still does in, in, in most of South Asia, is for uh, a branching model where loan officers 
are based at a branch, but they themselves get on a motorcycle and drive to each individual village to attend those weekly or monthly re repayment meetings. And so microfinance is gonna be much more profitable if those loan officers can be very productive. If within a village, there can be lots of borrowers. And uh, if that loan officer is able to get to many different villages over the course of a day. Um, and so population density really goes in your favor on minimizing those costs of intermediation. And I think that's just a big benefit of the high population density uh, characteristics of South Asia versus the lower population density of, of much of Sub-Saharan Africa. So that would have been my first answer maybe 10 years ago. And then my second answer ties into um, the lecture you're going to see by Tavneet Sori. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has really, you know, leapfrogged the rest of the world in terms of digital payments adoption. Um, and so uh, I think that, um, you know, as we'll talk about later, with the rise of, um, you know, M-Pesa and Kenya and other types of mobile payments, there are a lot more options for, uh, for fintech, uh, fintech advances. Um, and so I think I think the, the other question about what lies ahead for MFIs after the pandemic, I think maybe we can postpone that until we get to um, my thoughts about how to tweak the contract structure and, and, and sort of to the next our next lecture is really going to focus a lot on that. You know, what have we learned so far and what what seem to be the promising directions for pushing this in the future? OK. Okay, so what did we say? We, we Remember, we have small loans. The borrowers tend to be women. There's a fixed regular repayment schedule that's only weekly or monthly, so this is a bite-sized, uh, somewhat bite-sized uh, amount due each time, dynamic incentives and group structure. Okay, so I'm gonna start with gender. So um, is this part of the recipe that, that makes it work? So there are several motivations for focusing on women. Now remember that uh, Mohammed Yunus uh, and the Grameen Bank, this was a nonprofit so social enterprise, and they did have a lot of a social goal in mind that was quite strong. And, and one, uh, one idea is that by lending to women, this might improve women's power in the household. And this is an objective in and of itself and could have big consequences. So that, that's one. Uh, number two, and this is the one that we're gonna be able to explore with the, the data, Women potentially have, are even more credit constrained than men in the same households. It might be that they have less mobility, it's less appropriate for them to interact with money lenders, and so they might be even more constrained, therefore their businesses might have even higher returns. And so by unlocking these very high return businesses, that generates a big demand and then also, also the repayment capacity as well. And then finally, this is one we have less, less information, but I think it's certainly plausible. Women are potentially intrinsically more reliable or pliable. And given what I just said about the model for loan officers coming on their motorcycle to, to collect payments, these are usually men, there's a power dynamic between the borrower and the collector. And this might also make it easier to extract resources from the women, but also could, uh, could generate some consumer protection concerns that we'll come back to later. So there's some pretty good data on returns to capital and especially returns to capital by gender. And the canonical study for thinking about returns to capital is by Suresh Jamel, David McKenzie, and Chris Woodruff, where they experimentally drop cash on firms in Sri Lanka. So what they do is they start from a census and they identify 405 households with a small business. So this is typically retail or some very light manufacturing with less than $1,000 in fixed capital. So this is excluding land and building. So these are, these are businesses that, you know, they, they exist, they're operating every day, but they don't have large amounts of fixed capital. And this is where you might think um, you, you, you would find credit constrained entrepreneurs. And then what they do is conduct a survey and they offer as an encouragement to participate a random price drawing. And the price drawing is actually the treatment in their RCT. So the unlucky, uh, entrants are the control group, they get no prize. And then some people are lucky and they get $100 or a $200 prize and they randomize between cash and in-kind. Okay. So what I'm showing you here are the profits uh, in Sri Lankan rupees by treatment group, um, where the first column are the profits for the no grant firm. So this is baseline what would have happened in absence of the intervention. The second, this is the, the 10,000 rupee grant, this is the $100 grant, 
they have a large increase in profits. This is These are just the male owned businesses. I'll get to the women in just a second. And for the $200 grant, you also see a large increase in profits relative to the no grant group, but there's no benefit of going from 100 to $200. So the punchline of the original paper was that the firms are credit constrained. They have high returns to capital. However, those returns to capital diminish quite quickly. So, um, and if I were to put error bars on these, both the $100 and $200 treatments would be distinguishable from the control group, but of course there's no distinguish, there's no ability to distinguish the impacts of giving $100 versus $200 to firms. So this is exciting. This is exactly part of that narrative. You have capital constrained firms out there who have lots of great projects that they could embark on if only they had access to credit. Um, however, when you look at the women-owned businesses, the picture is quite different. So there's no evidence whatsoever that uh, when a woman-owned business gets $100 dropped onto it, there's any increase in profits. Um, and so I think this is, this is quite puzzling and this is the opposite of our prediction that because women potentially have less access to the capital market than men, their businesses should have higher returns. So this is, a, this is pretty surprising and this is pretty puzzling that the women owned businesses have a marginal product of about zero. And so we can try to think about why that is. Well, the smaller loans, it, it turns out, they, the, the authors do a lot of digging to try to understand this a bit more. The smaller loans are not invested in the business, but the larger loans are invested in the business, uh, but women are in less profitable industries. So there's some sort of composition going on, maybe the same constraints that make women uh, have less access to the capital market, maybe their businesses are, are, are more constrained for whatever reason. Um, and then we have some more recent evidence that's quite consistent with this. Um, the the uh, By um, Ariel Bernhardt and co-authors, where uh, they use data from this experiment and they show that intra-household dynamics are actually quite important at explaining this phenomenon. So they actually go use data from the same experiment plus two other experiments, one in India and one in Ghana. And they show that the, the zero marginal returns only kicks in when the household also has a male-owned business. And so the, the, the large returns that we see for the male-owned businesses are also there for women's owned businesses, but only in the case where the women's owned businesses are the only uh, only entrepreneurship activity of that household. So a mechanism one is that there's, you know, potentially some sorting by sector, um, or there are maybe norms over relative earnings, the man should earn more. So the, you know, the money should go to him first, or maybe the woman has domestic duties. If there are two businesses in the household, she's the one who needs to spend more time on, on home production, etc. So the, the household production is set up for the man's business to be more profitable. And the second mechanism is that this is something about intra-household bargaining power and expropriation. And we'll come back to this next time when thinking about tweaks to the contract structure that might make the impacts even larger. Okay, and, and this is consistent, this is uh, with the broader inefficient household literature um, pioneered largely by Chris Udry and, and others um, uh, uh, as well that, uh, households don't be necessarily behave efficiently um, uh, with, uh, with respect to the allocation of resources between men and women. Okay, so it doesn't appear that, uh, you know, the fact that women's businesses have higher returns to capital and microfinance lends to women is the, the driving force uh, for microfinance's success. How about dynamic incentives? So the logic here is that borrowers have incentives to repay because if they do, they'll get a bigger loan in the future. So here's an example. Suppose we have an initial loan of $80 and there's $10 due each month for 10 months. And then the contract says, if the household repays, they receive a new loan of $95 in month 11. Okay. So one might think, oh, that's great. You start with 80. If you repay your loan, you end up getting 95. That's a good deal for the household. But there's a problem. There's an arbitrage opportunity. If you default, you get to keep all of the promised payments, both principal and interest, to the lender. So um, at the end of the loan term, what would you, suppose what you do instead is you, you arbitrage this. 
you say, I'm never going to pay the MFI. I'm going to just save all of that money that I would have paid the MFI each month under the mattress. So, okay, fine. That's $10 a month for 10 months. That's $100. So at the end of the loan term, I'll have $100 saved under my mattress. When I get to month 11, if I repaid, I only get the $95 from the MFI. If I put the money under my mattress, I've just generated $100 for myself for that new loan. So if the second loan is any smaller than $100, I should default and just keep the money all to myself if I have this free savings opportunity. And we can make the same logic for loan three, loan four, et cetera, et cetera. There, the, and just remember, there aren't any strict consequences for defaulting. The legal system can't really come after you. There's no collateral. And so you know, there isn't that kind of financial cost like you would have in a collateralized loan from defaulting. So what does this mean? For the dynamic incentive alone to be able to sustain repayment, the loan size needs, the loan size needs to grow faster than the interest rate. And this is just simply unsustainable. And this is the same logic as Bulow and Rogoff's um, 1989 paper, in the, their papers in the context of sovereign borrowers, but they make a very similar point that the threat of future credit denial is insufficient to provide borrowers incentives. You need something else uh, on top of it. So dynamic incentives can't be the full story. You need something else too. You might need that households actually can't put the money under the mattress or the microfinance institution is giving you something that is complementary with the loan that makes the business more profitable. Um, but, but actually it doesn't seem like that latter case is the same. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, I think, so, so, so dynamic incentives, you kind of need something else. Well, what about the weekly repayments and repayment discipline? Well, many microfinance institutions are completely convinced that regular repayment schedules are essential for repayment. Um, and so the structure, uh, and where is this coming from? Well, the, the loans have a lot of structure on them, right? So you're repaying it at a very high frequency. You get in a habit of repaying. The loan officer is coming to you uh, and sitting there in potentially in your house or in a local place in your village until you find the, 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 the money to repay, repay. So the structure provides a lot of discipline. It also provides reminders. And um, you know, if, if you tend to procrastinate saving, it's much easier when the amount you owe is somewhat small on a weekly basis than if you owed a big balloon payment at the end. And then finally, it's easier to kind of, you know, nudge your peers into helping you, bailing you out when you have a shortfall at any one period, if it's a small amount at, at a sort of high frequency and you're interacting, interacting a lot. But we'll come back to social forces later. And so if we, if we try to add um, to some of this to the previous dynamic incentives story, we might be able to get some bite. So suppose that people uh, procrastinate or have demands on their cash. So anytime I have cash in my house, I can't possibly put it under the mattress. I'm either going to be tempted to spend it because of, let's say, time and consistency, or maybe, you know, some family member is going to come with some urgent need and that cash ends up getting, getting spent elsewhere. So, um, you know, in that case, that arbitrage opportunity I just talked about on the previous page might not be available. Now, we know that we can accumulate, suppose people like to accumulate lumpy, uh, lumpy sums. So people like to buy durable. So let's say a refrigerator or a television um, for consumption or an asset for their business. We know that savings is one way to do this. You, you know, do you deposit your savings little by little until you've accumulated a big lump and then you make a withdrawal. And if you're doing this over time, you might be able to build yourself a savings cycle. What microfinance does is it creates a credit cycle. So you get, a, you get the loan disbursement right away, you repay over small bite-size increments, you get your second loan, you repay over bite-size increments. So credit, what the credit cycle does is it simply takes that savings cycle and it changes the timing. And so it makes that first loan disbursement happen right away. So when you're in the middle of either type of cycle, either a savings cycle or a credit cycle, you actually, they look identical from the point of view of the borrower. You're making small payments to get a big lump sum, and then you're making small payments to get a big lump sum. And either way, if it's credit or savings, it doesn't really matter. 
Therefore, all of the same kinds of, of behavioral or, you know, um, kin tax things that, that I'm sure you talked about in your savings lecture also apply when people are trying to think about making loan payments. So in a sense, if microfinance contracts make it quote unquote easy for people to repay, then microfinance might look like a commitment device. So it could be that I can't save the money on my own under the mattress, but because microfinance is rigid enough, there's a man coming to my house every week asking for this money. I can't, you know, I, that helps me get around these kin tax issues or the psychological issues. Um, and it solves some of those problems for me. And we know that many borrowers do use loans to make durable purchases. Some people even talk about borrowing in order to save. They, they might borrow, they'll put a lump sum into their daughter's dowry and then, you know, repay that loan. Um, and so in, in some sense, you know, we usually think of um, one of consumption credit, you bring consumption forward in time, but under time and consistency, individuals might never be able to follow through on, a, a, on their savings plan on their own. And so you might be willing to pay the interest rate to, uh, for the micro loan to provide this structure. So this is kind of an expensive commitment device. So it might be that something along those lines is at least giving people some motivation to actually stick with it because we know there is a demand for commitment savings product from other products from other contexts. So what do you need for this all to hang together? You need there to be a demand for ongoing lump sum consumption, all of, either for your business or for your household's needs. You need there to be an inability to save for that durable on your own because of say present bias or kin tax type concerns. Microfinance needs to be structured enough to make missing a payment costly or to lower the temptation or inattention costs. And you need those dynamic incentives so that you know, you're gonna get a new loan every time you finish repaying. Um, and there have been some papers by Gautuck and Fisher and also Basu uh, developing the theory of this uh, in the background for microfinance. Now in terms of evidence, there's not really as much as we might hope for. There's one very nice sort of lab in the field kind of paper by Afsal et al in Pakistan, where they offer a series of weekly maturity loan and savings products to the same population. And what they document is that a large fraction of participants take up both loans and savings and they show with a model that their behavior is consistent with the kind of model I just sketched out here. Okay, so then, then the question is, well, you know, one important ingredient here is that microfinance structure actually does create discipline. So um, Erica Field and Rohini Pandey did set up a study to test exactly this with a microfinance institution in Kolkata. So what they did is they took groups, they took 100 groups that had already existed in the past that, or they already had joined. So the selection is the same. And they randomized them by public lottery into a few different kinds of, uh, of, of, of scenarios. So the, the first scenario is that they got the, the status quo. They got the regular repayment schedule, which was weekly meetings with weekly repayments. They randomized some people into monthly repayment schedule with monthly meetings. And they randomized the third group into a monthly repayment schedule with weekly meetings. So what this allows them to understand is, is it the act of meeting and reminding myself that I should be saving up for my next payment? Or is it really the fact that I am making this smaller bite-sized weekly loan instead of the, the, monthly, the monthly installment, which would be four times larger? And so this, this design allows you to, to decompose those two different those two different features. Okay, so here are the here's sort of their headline results. Um, what I'm plotting here is the proportion of loans that were fully repaid within 56 weeks. These are, uh, I think, 50 week maturity loans, or uh, so this you know within six weeks of the the due date. In the um, weekly payment weekly meeting group, it's about 97 percent. This is like the, the, the controller status quo. Um, in the monthly payment weekly meeting group, it's 97%. It's the same. And oops, sorry. The, um, in the monthly payment monthly meeting group, it's actually a hair higher rather than lower uh, at 98.5%. And now none of these is statistically distinguished from one another. So really doing this makes no difference at all to... Um, to, to repayment. 
So uh, this suggests that potentially this commitment story is a little bit less likely. It also suggests that the, you know, the MFIs are, are potentially overly rigid uh, with the frequency of, of payments, et cetera. Um, but I guess it also, I guess the, the flip side could be that the monthly frequency is enough to contain all of those commitment benefits that, that you need. But I do think it's quite telling that you really don't get anywhere when you move from monthly to weekly. Monthly, monthly still has about 100% repayment, just like weekly, weekly. Okay, I see that a bunch of questions have come in, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pause to to take those. Um, yes, so let me start with the. Um, so I think a lot of the questions are on the gender. Um, the gender element. So there's a question, could it be the case that women's businesses are less effective in these countries? For some reason, they can just sort into such kind of business. So that was the original hypothesis of the Demel, McKenzie, and Woodruff team, that they're in sectors that are less productive. There are other constraints that keep their, their businesses less productive. Um, but I think that's a little bit at odds with the, the um, Bernhard et al. paper, which actually shows that if you have a, a household that only has one business and that business is run by a woman, when you drop capital onto that business, it has very similar patterns to what's going on with men. So I think that complicates that narrative a bit. It certainly is the case that women's businesses do look different on average, but I think the, the Bernhardt paper really pushes the uh, intra-household um, bargaining issues as being an important component, not necessarily the only one, but an important component in understanding that. Okay. Um, in India, there was a microfinance crisis in 2011. Yes, I'm going to talk about it extensively next time. I have some work exactly on that. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we can talk a lot about that. Um, okay. Uh, are there ex exemptions when women entrepreneurs face health problems caused by long work hours or high stress? Um, are there exemptions when fa the family members sick, specifically kids? Um, so I think the answer to all of that is yes, the model is a bit flexible. And a lot of that comes through the group structure, which we're going to turn to next. So if you know that your neighbor had a, had a shock, I think one of the things that microfinance institutions like about this model is they can say, okay, fine, you know this woman, you know she had a problem, but you know she's good for it, so you should chip in and make her payment for her. So I think that helps to, to, minimize, um, to minimize default. Uh, that's something nice about the group structure from the point of view of the lender. I also spent some time going around and talking to group members a lot um, for some of my various research projects. And we talked to one woman who said, look, my house burned down. Um, I couldn't make the payment. It wasn't fair for my, for my neighbors to have to make the payment. And I think in those types of situations, the microfinance institution can use discretion and give some of these exemptions. So I think they... I think they would say that this, this group model means that they don't have to make a lot of exemptions because the group can kind of bail one another out. But for, this, for the things that are very out of the ordinary, such as a house burning down, I think they're, depending on who your lender is, um, you, might, you might get a little bit of a pass. But this, this ties in a little bit to a debate um, about, you know, should this be a for-profit or a non-profit kind of movement if the non-profit types of lenders can be more sensitive to these to these types of issues. And, and I don't think they're, um, I don't think that uh, um, uh, there's been a lot of research on on that kind of on that kind of thing. But that's in, in, in principle, I think what that debate is centered around. Okay, and then there's one last question. In modern times, women have more access to several markets. Is still is gender still a driving force for microfinance? Yes, I think a lot of the, the standard joint liability ones are still lending to women. Um, and I'll come back to the end about some of my hypotheses there. Uh, and I think especially in places like South Asia, uh, there's still a lot of evidence, you know, uh, that women face barriers to, to labor force participation, to entrepreneurship, and that those problems haven't gone away in many corners of the world where microfinance is, is, is active. Okay, great questions. Okay, so I'm gonna to turn to social capital, 
So this is the social capital is a key component of many informal financial products predating microfinance. Again, as I said before, Roscoe's Merry-Go-Rounds, Village Savings Loan Association, self-help groups, these have all operated on this idea of a group of people, men or women, coming together to pool resources and to take small amounts of money from you know, each of 20 people and turn that into larger lump sums. Um, and microfinance came in and, and, and took that kind of social infrastructure and borrowed it and, make, and made that more formalized. So why might the social component help? So there could be several reasons. Uh, first of all, joint liability, which again, is this idea that you're asked to bail out your neighbor, your group member, if she happens to miss a payment, and your group can't move forward and borrow their next loan, um, unless everybody has a successful repayment record. So this gives incentives to screen and to monitor. So there's been quite a bit of theory work thinking about the incentives to screen. Um, and Gottalk 99 shows that this generates assortative matching on risk. And again, there, there, there are some very interesting theoretical predictions there. Um, but uh, Carlin and Zinman um, with Garrett Bryan, they, they run a similar study to the one I think Abhijit talked about to think about measuring um, not just individual adverse selection and moral hazard, but thinking about referrals into credit and measuring uh, adverse selection or peer screening and also peer monitoring. So they have a very similar two-stage research design. When they use that two-stage research design, again, in South Africa, they don't find any evidence that inter individuals refer better borrowers when incentivized on borrower performance. Um, so, it doesn't seem like there's that much scope within a person to screen. But on the other hand, you could have something like simple homophily at play. Homophily just means that people are more likely to be friends and have, you know, can have social ties with people who are like themselves. So it might be that bad types themselves are less likely to have friends who want microfinance. And therefore, peer screening could still serve a role if you're able to identify one person who's a good borrower then their friends are typically going to also be more likely to be good borrowers. So even if there's not that much screening capacity kind of within a person, um, there still could be some reasons why you get advantageous screening. But I think this is probably second order given the, the, the field evidence. I think more importantly, the social component can also help with monitoring and enforcement. Um, so uh, there are explicit incentives to monitor and punish under joint liability. Besley and Cote have a very nice model of this, um, where individuals have access to punishment using social collateral. So on the upside, individuals cover for defaulters and increase your payment. So let's say somebody's sick, somebody had to miss work, uh, they, they suffered an accident, uh, the kid needed, uh, had health expenses, et cetera. This, if it's idiosyncratic, then the neighbors can, can cover for the person who had that shock. Uh, that would increase repayment capacity. But there could also be a negative side to this. If enough members want to default, then the whole group defaults. There's actually quite a, a nice paper by Bond and Rye called Borrower Runs, which considers the fact that you could have multiple equilibria. You know, in, in good times with small idiosyncratic shocks, everybody repays. But then you know, if something about the state of the world switches or there's an aggregate shock and, you know, the, the whole thing can unravel very quickly. And this, this is a little bit um, uh, relevant for the question about the Indian microfinance context, of the crisis, and we'll, we'll come back to this next time. Um, so it could be that social, on average, in good times, social capital is helpful, but it also creates more volatile repayments. So what do we? What kind of uh, evidence do we have on on enforcement effects? Well, in the Brian Carlin and Zinman paper, in their referrals experiment, very similar to the original Carlin Zinman paper, they don't find evidence of screening, but they do find quite substantial evidence for enforcement effects. So it does seem that when people refer their peers, they have money on the line if their peer defaults, they're able to exert pressure to get them to repay. So there is a little bit of, of positive evidence there. That, that maybe this, this, this joint liability structure is onto something. However, in another paper by Dean Carlin, Gina and Carlin, they randomly, this is more in the context of microfinance instead of those individual liability loans from South Africa, they actually go in and randomly relax joint liability. So what, what I'm gonna show you uh, in the first two columns, the first two bars, 
uh, are the baseline clients, the people who selected in before they change the contract structure. Everybody selected in in these this baseline sample into joint liability. Um, for the people who selected into joint liability and got joint liability, um, the proportion of missed weeks is about seven and a half percent. So this is the you know the final default rates are much much lower, but people are missing a payment here or there. But by the end, everybody is kind of coming out um, without a, a big default. If you relax joint liability, if you take away joint liability, you keep all of the meetings, but you make it individual liability, that number goes up to 0 0.08, so 8%, and it's statistically indistinguishable from the seven and a half. So there's just not a huge kick. There's not a huge uptick in defaults. If you keep all of the other trappings of the group structure, but you take away that contractual joint liability, it's it, there's really not a big effect. Moreover, they can look at the new clients, the people who selected in to microfinance um, under these different contract structures. So this is going to have a selection effect and a treatment effect built in. You might think that the people who select in under individual liability are worse because they're not being screened as carefully by their peers. But again, you know, it ticks up from 6.9% of a missed uh, proportion of missed weeks to 7.4%. And again, that's not statistically significant. So there's there's no evidence of an increase in default when you take away joint liability um, and you relax it to individual liability so long as you're keeping, you know, but, but this is a context where they're keeping all of the other trappings of the group together. Um, so kind of a clarifying question, what group sizes are we referring to? So this can vary. Um, I think the small on the small side, it's about 10. On the large side, it's it can be like 30 to 50, something like that. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, uh, so there's been a big in the theory literature. There's been a big focus on the joint liability component, but uh, there's been a broader industry-wide shift away from joint liability without a drop in repayment. So a lot of the traditional joint liability lenders have moved away from contractual joint liability, but they're keeping all of the other social trappings sort of similar to the treatment group here in the Gina and Carlin paper. Um, and so then that means that the group structure could still matter. There could still be reputational inf incentives that foster better repayment behavior. And so um, I'm going to talk very briefly about a paper of mine in the context of savings that I think can speak to some of these reputational concerns. So in the Besley and Cope paper, which is, which is about joint liability, it also talks about how um, reputational uh, capital can be deployed to keep people uh, behaving according to you know, the, 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 uh, the social, uh, the, their initial plans. So if somebody, uh, so the contributing member may admonish his partner for causing him or her discomfort and material loss, that's joint liability. But he might also report this behavior to other people in the village augmenting the admonishment felt. So even if the person's not wronged directly and financially, this is just suggesting that by spreading that information that this person's a bad type, um, that might in and of itself have reputational costs in the community. So in this, in this experiment, what we did, we did it in the context of savings because we wanted to keep this as simple as possible. We recruited villagers who expressed a desire to save more. We randomly assigned a monitor from the same community to observe their biweekly progress toward their preset savings goal. And then we can ask if, does a monitor help that people reach their savings goal? Like do people, does that give some sort of, you know, payment incentive and you're paying into yourself? Um, and then our second question is, do certain types of monitors have stronger effects than others? And what we really went into the project focusing on was whether people who are important in the social network whether they have more influence and they can provide sort of stronger incentives for somebody to follow through with that plan. Um, and, and why were we interested in centrality? Well, set central individuals in a community are those who have you know, much more, um, who, are, who are much more important when it comes to spreading information. When a central person speaks, many more people hear that message than when a peripheral person speaks. Okay, so what I'm showing you on the left panel is um, the total end savings, remember this is a savings experiment, for people who had no monitor, 
that, that's the, this is the CDF of their total savings on the left. And then um, the darker line is the CDF of total savings for the treatment group that got assigned a random monitor from the community. So getting any sort of monitor, having some peer from your community just watching you where they don't have any kind of skin in the game, um, you have a shift uh, in the whole distribution to the right, which is consistent with higher overall savings. Now, we can also break this down by whether you were randomly assigned a low centrality monitor, that's the, the light line, versus a high centrality monitor. We find that the people who have this, this greater kind of informational power in the network, that also gets people to save more. Um, and what we can show now, you know, centrality could be correlated with many things. It could, could be correlated with wealth. It could be correlated with political power. But what we're also able to show is that people information about people's, you know, success or failure is much more likely to spread when you have a, a central, a central monitor. And it does look like people's beliefs about you did change. So this gives some credence to the idea that reputation by itself could be a motivating force to households to kind of stick to the plan and engage in that behavior that they had committed to upfront. Okay. So um, uh, there, there are a couple of other papers that I wanna to point to that can speak to social capital. So Fiegenberg, Field and Pandy, um, what, uh, remember that they uh, random, they're looking at the randomization to the weekly versus monthly group meetings. Um, and they can look at holding fixed the no joint liability treatment. And they can ask, well, is there any evidence that social capital is actually changing as a function of the meeting structure? So what they find quite interestingly at the end of that first loan cycle, despite the fact that in the first loan cycle, there were no differences in repayment, they nonetheless, they find more altruism between the borrowers who'd been in the weekly meetings together versus the monthly meetings. And there are more social interactions. They're more likely to know each other's children. They're more likely to go watch TV or what, or, or, or what have you at each other's houses. And then what's kind of interesting in the next loan cycle, the formerly weekly groups have lower defaults than the formerly monthly groups, even though they're all on the same exact contract structure. So what that suggests is that they, and they also present some suggested evidence that they might be more willing to bail one another out. So this is suggesting that something about social capital, even an absence of joint liability is, is important and, and, and does matter. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, okay. And then in a, a paper of mine, I look for peer effects in loan repayment. And I, um, I look, I use variation from a very sudden and unexpected policy change that banned microfinance in one district of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and that this is something that was uh, eventually reversed. So this relates to the one question that's still left uh, unanswered. You know, when there are these really big, um, you know, disruptions, these aggregate shocks, microfinance institutions have to decide how to, to react. This is one that happened in 2006, and it was a precursor to the big, big Andhra Pradesh wide microfinance shock that originated in 2011. So I can give you the example of how the, the lender um, kind of responded here. And then I can also, you know, the, some, some similar kinds of, of principles also apply for the COVID shock, et cetera. So the lender, so what happened was this, there was this politician who basically made microfinance illegal in one small district of, of Andhra Pradesh, India. Um, and then the, the, this ordinance was in place for a while. And then at some point it was, it was relaxed. What the lender did is they said, okay, we understand we can't just hold you to the contract you signed at the beginning. The world has totally changed. So what we're gonna let you do is repay the loan in as many installments as necessary the original one that you kind of inadvertently defaulted on because of the policy. Once you've paid off all of the principal and interest of your previous loan, then we're just gonna put you back in a normal, you know, regular loan, just like what you had before. And you can reform groups, et cetera. Um, in, this, in this period, they suspended joint liability. They took away any contractual peer effects. And the MFI said, look, we're not gonna to try to poach different you know, we're not trying to, we're going to try to poach each other's customers. We're going to let everybody try to, you know, restart microfinance operations. And I think, you know, microfinance institutions understand that this is a bit of a fragile model. 
And so when there is a big aggregate shock like this, most of them will try to say, huh, there's, you know, demonetization, there's no cash in the, in the economy, people can't make payments. So we'll give, you know, some number of weeks uh, until this all works out. For the COVID shock, I think that the, the, the many probably had a very similar policy to this. You know, a lot of the livelihoods were really shut down. They, they would put a pause on, on, repay, on collecting repayments. Um, I think some of this would have been forced by the government, but some of it would have been voluntary because it's the only way they could resuscitate some of these, these borrowers. But again, this, this ties into the question of for-profit versus nonprofit. The nonprofit lenders, I think many would argue, would be much more likely to try to meet the customers where they are and you know, come up with you know, uh, at, uh, repayment plans that aren't extremely expensive for the borrowers. But, I, but on the other hand, microfinance institutions have a lot of control themselves in exactly how strict they want to be. This is the example from just one for-profit lender following this other crisis. Okay, so now I've shown you the, the, the nature of these loans is quite cyclical, right? So people are repay, 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 get your new loan, repay, 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 get your new loan. So if there's a big disruption and you stop paying for a year, it's going to matter where in the loan cycle you were when microfinance stopped uh, when you're making the decision about whether you want to eventually start borrowing again from this, this MFI, microfinance institution. So suppose you were in week 48 of your 50-week cycle. Now things have resumed, the crisis is over, the microfinance institution comes back to you and says, okay, if you pay me these two weeks of installments, we'll get you your new loan right away. People are going to say, yes, that's great. That sounds good. A lot of people will say that. However, if you were in only you know, the second week of your second loan cycle, you have a lot of payments to make before you get any benefit whatsoever. So that's just going to give differences in people's own, you know, interest in, in making this, making these, these, you know, becoming regular and rejoining microfinance. So that's true at the individual level. And we know that the loan disbursements are staggered uh, just by, you know, variation in when people needed to borrow. This is also going to create variation in the peer group's repayment incentives. So in this particular context, I'm going to have separate sources of variation to identify both your own incentives to repay and the incentives of your peers in your borrowing center to repay. Now, the one little wrinkle is that there's no variation in the week in the cycle at the group level. So the 10 people around me who are in that very sort of strict joint liability group However, what they do typically at these meetings is they aggregate three to five groups together and they all come to the same exact meetings. They say a pledge at the beginning. They see a public announcement of each other's payments and they're from the same communities. So what I'm going to look at is what's happening when the other groups that come to the same meetings as me have stronger incentives to repay. Does that, give, does that make me more likely to repay my own loan conditional on my own personal incentives? So this is the own incentives picture. So this is exactly the logic I was telling you before. These are 50 week loans. So if I was in week 48 of my relationship with the MFI, I only had two weeks left and then I get a new lump sum. These people are, are about 60%, 60 percent of the people who are in that situation eventually repaid within about a year and a half. Um, but only about 10% you know, of people who were just a few weeks ahead who had just gotten their second loan, but had a huge amount left to repay, they have much lower likelihood of repaying. And you see that um, when you go from cycle one to cycle two, and you see that when you go from cycle two to cycle three. So we can use that same variation in the incentives of the other people who are attending those meetings with me. So um, column three is the easiest one to pay attention to. This is gonna be an IV uh, specification, but this is saying if all of those other people in my center who aren't in my group, but they're coming to the meetings with me, if their repayment incentives go, if, if their repayment goes from zero to 100%, that increases my repayment by 11 percentage points. So that means that the center level peer effect is about 10%. People do, people are affected by the behavior of those around them, which does suggest that the, the group structure is, has some bite. And in this context, some of that is good. It's pulling people into paying, but some of it also might be keeping people from, from repaying. Okay, so the social stuff does seem to, to matter, 
um, but maybe not in the contractual joint liability way that we had, that all of the theory had spent so much time focusing on. Okay, so just to take stock, it doesn't seem like women have higher returns. In fact, they have much lower returns on average. Now this, you know, this might not be because women inherently are worse at business, but it could be a function of other constraints. And we'll come back to this next time to think about how to tweak the contract structure to improve, um, improve the returns for women-owned businesses. Number two, dynamic incentives alone don't buy much. Number three, there's no difference between weekly and monthly repayment, but it's still possible that, that the monthly repayments alone are creating some kind of incentives, especially with the gender power dynamic. Um, there's limited evidence of peer screening. There's little evidence that joint liability by itself matters much, but social capital and reputation a bit more broadly, that might be quite important. So um, that's kind of where we land about what in this recipe is working so well. Okay, I, I know I took a bunch of questions throughout, but I'll just pause and make sure there's, there's, there's nothing else about any of, any of that. Okay, so um, I, I wanted to talk just a minute about scalability and, and sort of you know wh why the profits are so high, what some outstanding research questions are uh, in the you know in, in this in this narrow space, and then I want to move on to talking about impact. Okay, so in addition to low default, the microfinance contract structure econ economizes on many types of intermediation costs. So there's minimal screening. There's minimal personalization or customization. That means that there's simple record keeping and accounting systems. There are also simple performance metrics for employees and it's easy to design incentives. So, you know, if you're giving the same loan to everybody, you can incentivize based on origination, getting loans out the door. You're gonna earn more profits if you have more loans, conditional on those repaying. And then you can also incentivize loan officers on default rates. So these are very, very simple metrics. Um, and if there's no screening, you don't need a lot of skill for credit officers, so the loan officers. So you can actually hire from a low wage uh, labor pool and um, you know, lower the, the intermediation costs that way. Um, and since they're not monitoring, you don't need to give them that much trust. There's just, there's, there aren't that, there's not that much scope for um, corruption in that kind of context. You just need to make sure that they're not stealing the cash from the, from the, the MFI. And this ties a little bit into the lazy banks model that Abhijit talked about in his lecture. Um, and so the costs of this type of model are mainly fixed. The credit officer just needs to be in the village every single week or every single month. And so that's really where the costs of this, this are coming from. And this is gonna be important to keep in mind when we try to go back to you know, understanding the impact evaluation results. Why do we see what we see? And if we tweak uh, various elements of the model, you know, some of this business, this, the, the profitability might, might diminish. So it's, it, I just wanted to flag this before we have those conversations. Okay, so I do think that in terms of thinking about your own research, what I just talked about is a pretty crowded literature. It's kind of shocking how much people have managed to randomize about microfinance. And I'm gonna even give you more examples next time. Um, so I think there are a few open issues still, uh, especially on the loan officers. How much repayment is because of some form of coercion? You know, sometimes you hear these stories that the loan officer refuses to leave the borrower's house until she's repaid or she's found a friend who's willing to vouch for her and repay on her behalf. Um, and, you know, relatedly, thinking about consumer protection and regulatory frameworks is quite important, as we'll talk about next time we'll see that there was this very large regulatory episode in India where um, there was a huge, huge shock in 2011 to the Indian microfinance sector, late 2010, 2011. Um, and that brought some of these questions of consumer protection uh, to the foreground. But if you're in a world with you know, thousands of loan officers going around rural villages, it's quite hard to think about the right consumer protection frameworks um, to monitor them. The, the regulator would need to be quite strong to be able to, to do much there. Okay. So impact. I think this is the this is kind of an exciting, exciting place to, to, to be. 
Um, so as I said, in the early 2000s, um, where when there was, you know, at the same moment, there was a tremendous amount of excitement for microfinance. This was the moment in development economics when RCTs were, were really gaining uh, traction. And in the case of microfinance, a lot of the practitioners were using proof by anecdote. They would cherry pick the one amazing success story and attribute that causally to what they were doing, um, but there hadn't been a rigorous set of evaluations. Uh, there was this, you know, so, so I think all of those types of uh, issues I talked about at the beginning, um, the social impact, the women's empowerment, the, um, the, the entrepreneurship mobilization, these are things that made the lenders themselves quite excited, but we just didn't, didn't have any you know, systematic evidence. So there were seven RCTs launched by different research teams between 2005 and 2010, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and this was in a range of countries. So Ethiopia, India, Mexico, Morocco, Bosnia, Mongolia, and the Philippines. There were some urban examples, some rural examples. There were some group examples and some individual loan examples as well. But this created a very nice body of evidence in terms of thinking about impact as a first pass. So these, these studies use two different randomization strategies. Um, the first is to find a lender who's interested in expanding to identify um, a set of places they'd be willing to go, and then to say, okay, uh, as the researcher, I'm gonna tell you, go to these 50% of locations and hold back and only go to the other 50% two years later. So that's the first strategy. The second strategy is to randomize at the bubble, so to speak. So you take two loan applicants who are just barely credit worthy, and you can randomize who gets a loan. So maybe you, you relax your lending standards just a little bit, and within that relaxed group, you randomize who gets the loan and who doesn't. So this is gonna, you know, these are all, all these are both gonna have kind of a different marginal uh, person whose impacts you are, you're identifying off of. Okay. Now, because of the narrative of microfinance and the very strong entrepreneurship focus, these studies were primarily set up to measure the causal impacts of microfinance on businesses in the one to two year horizon, so in the short run. So the outcomes and typically that everybody cares most about include business profits, revenues, inputs, um, also household consumption. If the business is doing better, are the households consuming more? Um, asset accumulation, and then also women's empowerment uh, because those women's empowerment type um, uh, aims were quite strong uh, when you talk to the practitioners, as I said at the top. So this is going to allow for measurement of the benefits from investing the loan proceeds. So this is going to all have an entrepreneurship narrative in mind. Um, and some of the studies have longer run follow-ups at about three-year outcomes, but none of the studies have much, none of these studies, um, when they were published, had much longer than that. So there's a very nice j -Powell, um case, uh, j -Powell document, which you know, shows the effects from all of these studies side by side, and I'm just gonna I'm gonna rely on that here. Um, so what this is, this isn't even getting to impact yet. This is just get this is just about take up. So what what am I showing you here? So each set of bars is a different study, um, and uh, um, I said that there were seven studies, and that's true. But the Mongolia one is split into two because they have an individual and a group arm. In some of the studies, the sampling strategy was just to go into the community and take a representative sample. And then, you know, at some point, um, the microfinance institution would make people eligible for credit. And this is going to give like the, the reduced form impacts on the average person in the community. In some of the other studies, they first did a screen on who was actually interested in borrowing. And then they were focusing on the types of, on the effects of microfinance on the types of people who had self screened into being, you know, at least somewhat interested in the product to begin with. Okay. So if we look at the, the left set of studies where they have a representative sample um, in each study the the green is the control group and the blue is the treatment group. And you can see that there is a first stage so across the board the take up in the treatment group is higher than take up in control. Um, and I think this is borrowing, yeah, so this is uh, borrowing from the study lender. However, what you might also notice is that these numbers are not super high 
So um, in India, for example, there's 5% take up in the control group and 17% take up in the treatment group. That gap is only about 12%. So a lot of lenders actually, the partners of the researchers in these studies had thought that way more people were interested in their loans. And it turned out that, you know, having um, the first stage difference between treatment and control is, is somewhere between 10 and 15%, except in the Ethiopia case, which already suggests that, you know, maybe some of the hype around this product is overblown. If a lot of people aren't interested, that means that, you know, they understand that it's not necessarily for them. And unsurprisingly, the take up is going to be much higher in the group that's pre screened to be interested in credit, but it's nowhere near 100% except in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay, so here are some of the results on business ownership. So remember, they're kind of in that entrepreneurship narrative, there are two things that could happen. Either you could invest in your pre existing business and expand it, or it could bring people who were credit constrained and didn't even have the resources to create a business, could bring them into entrepreneurship. Um, and so this is really looking for that second, uh, the second one. Um, and in the studies, the representative sample studies, there, there's no statistically significant evidence that it's actually increasing business ownership at the household level. Um, however, you know, it is in, in, a, in two of the studies in the Bosnia and the Mongolia group study. But this again, isn't exactly the narrative that people had in mind. It's not that you're seeing a tremendous number of people rushing to go start a business. You're actually seeing pretty stable numbers um, in, in, in six out of the eight sites. Uh, and then this is, these are the results for other key outcomes. A green arrow is a statistically significant positive. Uh, a red arrow is a statistically significant negative, and the 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 dash is just um, an absence of a statistically significant result in either direction. So what you can see is that again, in two of the studies, business ownership goes up. In two different studies, business revenue goes up across the entire population. Um, so that's that's already not that's telling us it's not this super transformative impact. On business inventory and assets, in most of the studies where, there, where people, where the researchers collected that as outcomes, that does go up. So people are taking at least a portion of the loans and investing it into the business. Um, their costs in three of the studies are going up, but taken together, that's just not flowing through to an increase in profits. And only one of the studies, the Morocco study, is there a statistically significant positive on business profits. So overall, there is no detectable impact on household income. There is no positive impact on overall consumption. In fact, in two of the studies, there's a negative impact. And on social well-being, um, again, it's it's a mixed bag. So I think that um, these results are much more mixed than people expected, and especially the practitioners expected going in. OK. so. Um, so there's a question about which elements are covered by the indicator social well-being. I think this one, measuring social well-being is clearly going to be um, tricky. This is going to be very hard to measure. So I think of all of these outcomes, any kind of women's empowerment or social well-being is going to be the, the hardest to capture and the noisiest. Um, and I think, I don't remember exactly how this index was created across studies and, I, and they're certainly measured in different ways. So I, I, would, have to, I would have to check uh, in the difference. Uh, how much of this difference res in results could be due to differences in measurement? Um, you mean from one to another? I think that uh, a lot of the time they did ask these questions in somewhat of a standardized way, but it is very tricky to get uh, measurements of profits. Uh, typically, you'll get a different answer if you ask for revenues and costs, and then you do the subtraction versus you just ask the household, you know, after you paid all of your costs, what were the profits that you got? Um, and so I think, you know, these are going to be noisy measures. And, you know, if, if these researchers could have done it again, I think there have been a lot of advances in how to ask some of these questions, and they would have done even more standardization than they had already done. So those are all those are all totally fair points. Okay, 
So uh, Rachel Meager has done some very interesting meta-analysis work, taking all of the micro data from each of these studies. Most of them are, are published in the same issue of the AEJ applied, and so you can just go download all of the replication data from most of these um, in one place. Um, and so, you know, the, the studies were designed to test the idea that microfinance solves credit constraints and allows small businesses to thrive. It's true that some of the funds are used for business. People do invest in their business more, but overall, the impacts are kind of disappointing on incomes and profits. Now, it's true that in some of the studies, there's a positive, a large positive coefficient on profits. It's just very noisy. Um, but overall, the, these results were a big disappointment to the practitioner and the donor community. Uh, so, you know, one of the takeaways is that borrowers must be spending the money, but 18 months later, it's pretty hard to see any lasting business or consumption benefits for that overall entire population. Okay. Um, there's one question I, I had missed from before, and please put, put your put your other questions in the in the Q and A. Um, are there any studies that look at forcible measures by fellow villagers to repay, and that investigate microfinance potential effect on social cohesion within the village and other social capital based mechanisms? So um, on the first part of that, in terms of of coercion, there is nothing like that. Um, I will talk about the impact of microfinance on risk sharing next time. I have one paper um, that, that tries to speak to that. What is the entry of microfinance do to, to network connections and the, the you know, risk sharing that's going on in the background? So I will have lots to say about that tomorrow. Okay, okay so I have seven minutes and I wanna talk about one more paper. Oh, um, okay. So I think that, you know, we just talked about the first pass impact evaluations. So the second pass at these impact evaluations, I think is, is asking a more narrow question. Um, maybe microfinance doesn't work for everybody. Take up isn't as high as people expected. And then those impacts aren't, aren't amazing across the board. But are there some people for whom that narrative is still true? And even in Abhijit's story, of um, misallocation. It's not that every single person with low wealth has high productivity. It's just that um, you know the formal credit market is missing a subset of those people who happen to also who, who actually of low wealth people who, who actually happen to have high productivity. So I'll, I'll be more um, precise in just a second. Okay. So in principle, credit could be beneficial for three reasons. The first is business investment, which is what we've spent all of our time talking about so far. The second is bringing lumpy consumption forward. This is the savings versus credit cycle stuff we talked about. That, that can have nothing to do with business, but still make microfinance look very desirable. And then third, um, microfinance could in theory, or credit could in theory be used to mitigate risks, um, right? If you can borrow when you have an adverse shock, that can have an insurance kind of, uh, of component. So on number one, there are modest impacts, nothing transformational. On number two, there's no test. But it's possible given some of the patterns of asset allocate asset accumulation seen in the data. Um, and there and there are no, and I didn't show this in those um, in those slides, but for the studies that have looked at it that have more than one data point, there aren't really any impacts on consumption variability. So it doesn't look like microfinance is doing much to mitigate consumption risk. Although this isn't surprising given that the contract structure is so rigid. If you're in a borrowing cycle, you don't really have the ability to change your payments to accommodate your shock. Okay. So, you know, what do we do with these findings? And um, well, I think the next place that, that, uh, um, that the literature has gone and, and the paper I'm gonna present is one of, of mine um, is that look, like these impacts are likely to be heterogeneous. For example, in the Hyderabad India study, which was one of them in the previous case, um, only 40, about 50% of microfinance borrowers have any business whatsoever at end line. And so that means a lot of them are borrowing for consumption, not business growth. So should it be that surprising that if half of them don't even have a business, you know, we don't see these transformative business effects for the average borrower, maybe not. It also might be the case that microfinance, in addition to you know, allowing, relaxing the credit constraints for the low wealth, high productivity businesses, it could also relax the credit constraints for some 
you know, low wealth, low return businesses, and it might cause the weakest businesses to enter as well. So that's going to, you know, um, neutralize or water down the effects that we see if we average across all of the kinds of people who are brought in and affected by microfinance. It also could be that microfinance loans themselves aren't large enough to transform the small businesses. So it could be that you, even with a $200 loan, if you still can't buy the machine that you need. You still can't buy a vehicle if you're an auto rickshaw driver, et cetera. Okay. So these, these investment impacts that we've been predicting since the top are likely most relevant for what we're going to call gung-ho entrepreneurs, people who are borrowing to scale their business. And what we're going to do is take the India study and use a very simple proxy. Did the household choose to enter entrepreneurship before microfinance was widely available? So those households would have, if they knew that they had high productivity, it would have been worth it for them to borrow small amounts at very high interest rates and enter. And then microfinance might be giving them a big boost that allows them to scale even bigger. And we can also look for evidence of a credit-based poverty trap for these businesses. Okay, so what we're gonna do is take the, the RCT variation from um, the, the India uh, study that was in that AEJ issue. There are 104 neighborhoods of Hyderabad that were selected by Spandana 1 MFI in 2005. They entered 52 of the 104 neighborhoods in 2006. They entered the control group in 2008. There was then an Indian microfinance crisis, so everybody lost access to credit. And then we went in and we did another survey in 2012. So we're going to compare people who had had more access in the past to less, less access in the past. Okay. So um, what, is, what does this mean? Um, well, when we think about uh, comparing the treatment versus control group, again, right, it's, they don't have access today, but some of them had more in the past. And so, for example, if we ask how much more credit did they have um, at, at N line two, this would have been, I think, uh, three years after microfinance, the treatment group had uh, had, had a thousand rupees more in credit. They were four percentage points more to borrow from any microfinance institution between 2004 and 2010. So there is some difference in the stock of credit they had experienced. Okay. So we can look at the reduced form outcomes. We can look on average, and then we can also break at, break them out um, based on whether they had that pre-existing business, whether we think they're that kind of serious gung-ho entrepreneur or not. And our results are quite different in 2012 than they were in the, in the, um, the 2008 and 2010 follow-ups. So now we see that they're four percentage points more likely to have a business on average. The businesses have larger asset stocks, they have larger profits, they have larger wage bills, they're hiring more other people. And there's a positive on non-business durables, although this one's pretty noisy, but that suggests that maybe consumption is also going up as well. You can see that a lot of these effects are coming from the gung-ho entrepreneurs, um, and there are more modest effects in the first row for the people who didn't have one of those pre-existing businesses. So this suggests that there are persistent effects of a one-time intervention that are largely coming from the people who um, had selected in when credit constraints were really, really tight. And especially on the profit side, you see really all of the profit effects are being driven by that, that the third of businesses that look like that. Um, we can then also ask, well, what's the relationship uh, between baseline wealth and endline wealth and treatment versus control. So what we see is that if you have very low baseline wealth, your biz the business assets are somewhat modest until a certain point, and then we have a big inflection. So this suggests that if microfinance got you over a certain hurdle, you were able to really grow your business quite quickly. But if you're, if you're very poor and microfinance isn't big enough to get you over that hurdle, it's not doing much. And moreover, what microfinance is doing is it's pushing down that inflection point. So this inflection point where you can access those high returns is happening at lower levels of wealth, which is exactly what we would hope in one of those standard models. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm out of time um, and I, I can skip this last part, but what this suggests is that um, part of the entrepreneurship story is actually going on uh, but it's only for a subset of borrowers. And so this suggests that if you really want to unlock the capabilities for those borrowers, you might want to work much harder at screening and, and putting more resources into the businesses that you know, have, have the potential for, for those high, high returns and high productivity. So it's not that that narrative that the microfinance practitioners were telling isn't there at all. 
it just doesn't happen to be the median person who's borrowing's narrative, but it's there for about a third of the borrowers. So I think this, you know, suggests that any kind of ability to improve screening or you know get more uh, resources to those successful entrepreneurs is going to have much bigger impacts um, on those kinds of profits and livelihoods than than uh, what the current model is doing. Okay, so I think I'll leave it there and we'll pick up next time with how to take some of these insights and run with it and improve the microfinance contract structure. Thanks so much.